Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and I am here today to do a Pulitzer Prize deep dive on Tinkers by Paul Harding. A very unique Pulitzer Prize deep dive because when the Pulitzer Prizes were announced in 2010, the book industry got one of the biggest shocks in the history of the prize. Certainly the biggest Pulitzer surprise of my lifetime. A little-known novella from a small publisher had pulled off a tremendous upset by claiming the Fiction Award. In an article written 10 years after the fact, Michelle Philgate, who will factor into this story again later, wrote that it was one of the biggest surprises in the history of American letters. I worked at Borders when this happened, and not a single person in the store had even heard of Tinkers or Paul Harding. We had never had a copy in our store, and it took us weeks to get any in stock after the prize was announced. This is not an uncommon experience. According to the New York Times, only 7,000 copies of Tinkers had been sold before the Pulitzer Prizes were announced. In fact, the New York Times was so surprised by the victory that they had to publish an article explaining how they hadn't noticed Tinkers before, referring to it as the one that got away because they had not even reviewed the book before it won. In 2010, before the Pulitzer, Paul Harding seemed much more like an author who was primed for future success, if you had heard of him at all, that is. The New York Times notes that, quote, within an hour of the Pulitzer announcement, Random House sent out a news release boasting of the two-book deal it had signed with Mr. Harding in late 2009. A few days later, the Guggenheim Foundation announced he had received one of its prestigious fellowships, end quote. The more usual career path would have relegated his debut novel, Tinkers, to nothing more than a test case, a trial run to get more people interested in his next book, which would have, hopefully, had an actual marketing budget and a major publisher to back it up. Instead, Paul Harding enjoyed a wildly improbable rise to literary success. Now, in 2023, he has released his third novel, This Other Eden, and been longlisted for the Booker Prize. I'll have a link to my Booker Prize longlist video down below. As we wait to see if Paul Harding will become the first person to have won both a Pulitzer Prize for fiction and a potential Booker Prize, let's just try to find out how this staggering upset happened in the first place. I want to cut in really quickly because... I found out about this and it just blew my mind and I was so excited and I really just wanted to do the video almost immediately, but I slowed myself down deliberately so I could, first of all, finish Tinkers before talking about it and then to try to make sure that I did all of my steps correctly. But I'm just so excited to share this story. It's wild. I love and I love it. It's wild and I love it. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. As usual with my Pulitzer Prize deep dives, I will have timestamps down below so you can navigate to different parts of the conversation. And I'm just going to tell you now that an author who factors into this and who I am going to compare Paul Harding to is Marilyn Robinson, who wrote Gilead, which is what I called the best book of the last 25 years. I'll have a link to that video in the description box down below, as well as other Pulitzer Prize videos and a link to a post about this topic on my website, which will have all footnotes and sources, as well as basically just a text of this video that I am creating right now. So before we go any further, I think it's important to talk about what Tinkers is about. And just a quick note, I have a British edition of this book. It's a hardcover, which is really nice. The American edition looks very different. I'll put the American cover up for just a moment. And then let's dive into what Tinkers is about. The first sentence of the book reads, George Washington Crosby began to hallucinate eight days before he died. As the book counts down the hours until his death, we also read the story of his father, an epileptic salesman named Howard. And that's kind of it. At least that's it without spoiling the cause of the rift between father and son and the rift that existed between Howard and his own father. There's more of a plot in the sections that are devoted to Howard in that he goes around and does things, experiencing a sort of progression along the way. I guess you could say that Howard's story is the inverse of George's for much of the book, 
while Howard walks around in nature and comes to a decision that will impact his family, George lies in a hospital bed, vaguely watching his family prepare for the end through a sort of dream state. In other words, Howard is activating while George is declining. The fact that Howard is long gone by the time we even meet George makes this something of an examination into the fleeting nature of life. Most reviews I see of this book mention that it is a celebration of the everyday, sort of like Marilyn Robinson and her book Gilead, and I believe a lot of her other books that I haven't read yet. But I never see much about how Harding was inspired by transcendental thinking, and how that inspiration is also felt in his new novel, This Other Eden. On the 10th anniversary of the release of Tinkers, here is how Harding explained his approach in an article that he wrote for LitHub. I came to think of the work as more or less transcendentalist, since so many of my favorite writers came out of that tradition. Emerson, Melville, Dickinson, Sarah Orne Jewett, even Faulkner, even maybe especially Shakespeare, the last two of whom usually are not thought of as transcendentalists, but I claim them nonetheless. Prevalent among their works is the privileging of our common humanity by virtue of examining and describing common human experience while forbearing any impulse to explain it. End quote. That is what Tinker's, and in some degree, this other Eden, is about. Now, let's get to the big question. How on earth did Tinker's win a Pulitzer Prize for fiction? My initial theory, going into my reading of Tinker's, had to do with the person who provided the blurb on the front cover of the American edition. And just before filming, I realized that the blurb is on this British edition as well. It's Marilyn Robinson. Tinker's is truly remarkable. There's an extended version of the quote on the back of this. Tinker's achieves and sustains a unique fusion of language and perception. It confers on the reader the best privilege fiction can afford, the illusion of ghostly proximity to other human souls. Again, that's Marilyn Robinson. At the time Tinker's was published, she was a recent Pulitzer Prize winner herself, thanks to Gilead. She was a teacher of Paul Harding's and became a friend and supporter of his. I assumed that if there was a solution to be found to this mystery, that it would be that Marilyn Robinson had used her clout in order to get people to pay attention to the work of her former student. What I ended up finding out is that this is actually a story about the power of independent bookstores, which, if you follow along, you can guess, absolutely thrilled me. I cannot emphasize that enough. It thrilled me. And it turns out the answer to this question has been out there the whole time. I just hadn't seen it, and I had to research it in order to find it. Although, let me backtrack a little bit before we get into that. To be fair, it isn't just independent booksellers who made this happen. It might be more accurate to call Tinkers a spectacular beneficiary of word-of-mouth success. This is a book that had a difficult time getting noticed, but which generated a lot of enthusiasm from people who did read it. Gregory Cowles, who wrote that article in the New York Times about how they had failed to notice Tinkers, noted the following, quote, I first heard of Tinkers nine months after it was published, when a judge for the Center of Fiction's first book award enthused about it to me. It was a finalist, but it lost to John Pipkin's Woodsburner. But just because we missed the book doesn't mean everybody did. It received glowing reviews from, among others, the Los Angeles Times, the New Yorker, and the Boston Globe, end quote. Tinkers was also included among NPR's list of the best debut fiction for the year, and it was counted as one of the year's best books by The New Yorker. But even with this level of critical recognition, it still would have seemed more likely that Harding was being primed for future success. And that takes us to the independent bookstore connection. When the New York Times interviewed Paul Harding in a report about how this happened, he was quick to thank Quote, Lise Solomon, a sales representative in Northern California for Consortium, the book's distributor, who passionately advocated for the novel with booksellers and the booksellers and critics who embraced the book early on, end quote. The article goes on to quote the aforementioned Michelle Philgate, an events manager for River Run Bookstore in New Hampshire, who had this to say, 
This shows how indie bookstores truly are the ones that can be movers and shakers when it comes to a book. Michelle Philgate is the important piece of the puzzle here. Not only did she rave about Tinkers on Bookslut, a now defunct book blog, but she is credited as the person who introduced this novella to a former editor of the New York Times Book Review named Rebecca Pepper Sinkler during a book reviewing workshop that Sinkler had led in New Hampshire in April of 2009, not long after Tinkers was published. You might be asking, why does this matter? Well, get this. This blows my mind. Rebecca Pepper Sinkler was the chair of the Pulitzer jury for fiction books published in 2009. Boom. Of course, Michelle Philgate had no idea that Rebecca Pepper Sinkler was the chair of the Pulitzer jury for fiction, but still, that's what happened. The events manager of an independent bookstore is single-handedly responsible for bringing tinkers to the attention of the Pulitzer jury and causing the biggest Pulitzer surprise of all time. Wow. Wow, I love it. The reason no one at my borders had heard of Tinkers is that we didn't have the infrastructure for this kind of community book selling. If we were hearing about a book, it was because the company was being paid by the publisher to run a marketing campaign for the book. Furthermore, it's very expensive to find a first edition of Tinkers because the first edition, or the first print run, consisted of only 3,500 copies. Here's a quote for you. Then a sales rep in San Francisco fell in love with the book. She got the book buyer at the independent bookstore Book Passage interested, and that book buyer brought Harding to the store for a signing event. Soon he was visiting other bookstores and getting invited to speak at book clubs. End quote. That is according to NPR. So, really, when you think about it, the fact that Tinkers had sold only 7,000 copies at the time it won the Pulitzer Prize is actually an enormous triumph. That is double the book's initial print run. And you can credit independent bookstores for that. Again, I love this story. Support independent bookstores. They are the lifeblood of the book community. Of course, I had to wear an independent bookstore t-shirt for this. I'm wearing Montana Book Company, which is my favorite independent bookstore. But let this go to show. Support your local independent bookstores and the community that they help to create. Another gem of a story about this situation is that because there were so few expectations for Tinkers on Pulitzer Day, no one called Paul Harding to tell him that he had won. He wasn't restlessly waiting for the announcement to come. Here is what Paul Harding told NPR about finding out that he had won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. Quote, Harding was alone when he checked the Pulitzer website, curious to find out who had won. I came as close to actually fainting as I think I ever have because I literally just could not believe what I saw when it came up on the website, Harding says with a laugh. And I kept refreshing and it just kept coming up, tinkers, 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 end quote. Harding then ran to the office of Marilyn Robinson, his former teacher, who again had won her own Pulitzer just a few years earlier. And she told him, quote, it's the American equivalent of knighthood. It's your title now, Pulitzer Prize winning author, end quote. I love that he checked the website himself. I love that he had no idea. I love that he ran to this wildly supportive and successful teacher that he had. I love literally everything about this story. And I have been so excited to share it with you. It's incredible. At every level, it is incredible. And I think an extension of how incredible this is, is how Tinkers was even published in the first place. So let's get into that. Here is how the New York Times analysis of Paul Harding winning the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction begins. Quote, Six years ago, Paul Harding was just another graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop with a quiet little novel he hoped to publish. He sent copies of the manuscript in which he had intertwined the deathbed memories of a New England clock repairer with episodes about the dying man's father to a handful of agents and editors in New York. Soon after, the rejection letters started to roll in. End quote. The manuscript for Tinkers 
infamously sat in a desk drawer for three years before Harding finally got interest from Bellevue Literary Press, a publishing imprint that had barely even existed at this point, and which only had two employees, Erica Goldman, the editorial director, and an assistant. That is it. No wonder no one called Paul Harding to tell him that he had won a Pulitzer Prize. They probably didn't even notice because they were so busy doing the jobs of a lot of people. Now, you have to hear this passage from NPR's interview with Harding after he won. It is insane and wonderful. Quote, Their office is in a most unusual setting for a publishing company, nestled, as Goldman puts it, within the Department of Medicine at the New York University School of Medicine, which is at Bellevue Hospital. Bellevue is a major center for emergency services in New York City, but it is probably best known in the public imagination as a mental hospital. That is true. I have lived in the New York City area most of my life. That is how people think of Bellevue. The hospital's literary press was established five years ago, mainly for the publication of high-end medical books, but Goldman, a veteran of the publishing business, is also committed to releasing works of fiction with a scientific or medical theme. A publishing colleague who had passed on Tinkers because it didn't seem right for his company thought it might work for Bellevue. End quote. So, let's break this down for a second. The only reason Bellevue... The only publisher who was even interested in this book, by the way, could publish Tinkers is because one of the characters is epileptic. That gave it a medical and scientific connection, which was the whole purpose of Bellevue, and I believe still is. By all accounts, Paul Harding has not forgotten that it was a small press and independent booksellers who championed his work when no one else would. When Bellevue published a 10th anniversary edition of Tinkers, this is what Paul Harding had to say in an essay that he wrote for LitHub. Quote, when Tinkers made it into print, I gained degrees of appreciation and love for independent publishers and bookstores I otherwise would not have had. I will forever be grateful that working with Erica Goldman at Bellevue Literary Press gave me entrance into the company of people who devote their lives to finding, editing, publishing, pitching, and selling books that might otherwise be overlooked, who do so for the same reasons I discovered over the years of learning to make art for art's sake, and who do so from the often fragile tabernacles of independent publishing houses and independent bookshops. End quote. When the two-book deal from Random House came in to Paul Harding after Tinkers was published, he only accepted the deal with the blessing of Erica Goldman, who encouraged him not to turn it down. He still considers himself an ambassador for small presses and independent booksellers, which again is something that I absolutely love. Let's get into the question of whether or not Tinkers is any good. In recent years, I've heard a lot of people refer to Tinkers as one of the best books published this century so far. Personally, I liked it a lot and I admire it greatly, but I didn't love it. And I think that comes down to a matter of personal preference. Harding's writing can be a bit overly complicated for me. His sentences can be long, bordering on run-on territory, containing multiple shifts in perspective or time. I'm really glad that I had read this other Eden first because it allowed me to understand that this is a stylistic feature of Harding's writing. It's something that has continued throughout his career. Now, I have this weird thing. When no one is around, I like to read aloud to myself or to my dog Jamie if she's around. I like hearing the words flow. There's musicality and rhythm that you only really find if you say the words out loud. Maybe this is why I like audiobooks so much. But anyway, the majority of Harding's writing flows as beautifully as Marilyn Robinson's. It really does not feel surprising that there's a connection between these two writers. But some of it is oddly difficult to read out loud. You start tripping over your tongue. The same thing happens if you read silently, but it feels more pronounced when you read out loud. Having read two of Harding's books back to back at this point, it appears that this is a sort of signature style in his writing. It's almost as if he doesn't want you to flow along in his words. He wants you to stop. He wants you to reread and consider. He's forcing you to actively read his words. I can see how this would annoy some readers. Indeed, I've seen reviews online that refer to his writing as fussy, and it is fussy at times. For me, there is a big payoff, but 
I'm probably never going to love the experience either. Now, I don't play music, so this metaphor probably does not make sense, but let's go with it. Imagine you're playing the piano and getting swept up in the music, and all of a sudden you hit a discordant note. You stop playing and look closer at the sheet music and find that it actually makes sense. So you play it again, and this time you still hear the discordant note, but in the flow of all of the other notes, it somehow sounds beautiful. That's Paul Harding as a writer. I think of Harding's writing as being very close to his former teacher, Marilyn Robinson, again, in terms of style, but I have also seen his work compared to William Faulkner, and I think that also fits. So I explain Paul Harding by saying that it's like William Faulkner and Marilyn Robinson had a baby. I will always respond more to the beauty and simplicity of his Robinson half, but there is still a lot of depth to be found in the Faulkner half. I would even say that there are passages in Tinkers that are just face-slappingly good. As in, you read a sentence that's so good it leaves you feeling abruptly stunned, like you've been slapped in the face. So you reread the passage several times, and it's not enough because it's just so good. Here is one of my favorite examples from the book. It comes from page 72. I actually prefer the following paragraph that follows this quote as well, but I'm just going to keep it at this for timing purposes. Here is your quote. And as the axe bites into the wood, be comforted in the fact that the ache in your heart and the confusion in your soul means that you are still alive, still human, and still open to the beauty of the world, even though you have done nothing to deserve it. And when you resent the ache in your heart, remember, you will be dead and buried soon enough. End quote. You can also see the fingerprints of Harding's transcendental inspiration there. Human and nature are inextricably linked in Harding's novels, at least the two that I have read so far. To experience the world is to experience nature. We are all trying to do our best, but can be easily corrupted. There is staggering beauty to be found in Tinkers, but I find that I want to love it more than I do. The same is true, incidentally, of his new book, This Other Eden. Still, they are objectively very good novels, and Harding is a talent I will continue to explore, first with his second book, Enon, which I have not read yet, and then with whatever comes next in his career. And let's talk about Paul Harding and who he is a little bit before we move on. Paul Harding grew up in Wenham, Massachusetts, which is north of Boston. He spent a lot of time in the woods. Harding also apprenticed under his grandfather, who fixed clocks, which is undoubtedly a source of inspiration for the clockwork that features heavily in Tinkers, and which is featured on the cover of the British edition of the book. While on break from touring as the drummer in a rock band named Coldwater Flats, Harding took a summer writing class at Skidmore, that was taught by Marilyn Robinson, who at that time had only released one novel, Housekeeping. Gilead was still in the future. She got him interested in the Iowa Writers Workshop, which is a famous place where many famous writers go. And while he was there, he learned from Barry Unsworth and Elizabeth McCracken. Elizabeth McCracken is also someone who has been very supportive of his career. There is a blurb from her and actually Barry Unsworth on the back of my edition of the book. Harding ended up studying theology after noticing that many of the people he admired were very religious, and this is how he became, as he calls it, a self-taught modern New England transcendentalist. Really quickly, I sometimes like to get into the question of whether or not there are adaptations or sequels of these books that have won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction, and in this case, there actually are. Paul Harding's second book, Enon, follows Charlie, who is the grandson of George Crosby from Tinkers. Charlie appears, or sort of appears, in Tinkers as one of two dreamlike grandsons who occasionally sit with George during his last days. And Harding's third novel, This Other Eden, heavily features the town of Enon. So Harding is sort of steadily building a universe of novels that are loosely and sometimes directly connected. I kind of hope he continues in this vein. It's almost Louise Erdrich without, there are a lot more connections in Louise Erdrich's novels, but I appreciate that he has these through lines that are going through all of his work. 
Now let's quickly ask ourselves, is Tinker's the Great American Novel? Because I feel like I have frequently linked my Pulitzer Project to the concept of the elusive Great American Novel, and that is largely because when the Pulitzer Prize began, it had a very similar intention as the discourse around the Great American Novel. Legitimize American art as worthy of praise and recognition. I will have a video down below where I really grapple with the idea of what the Great American Novel is and if it's possible to even have one. And while Tinker's is an admirable novella, I don't think it really fits into that conversation at all. Now let's talk about what Tinker's' competition for the Pulitzer Prize for fiction was. Obviously, the most direct competition would, of course, be the other finalists from 2009. Daniel Munadin's In Other Rooms, Other Wonders, and Lydia Millet's Love in Infant Monkeys. In Other Rooms, Other Wonders is a story collection about social status and expectations within Pakistani culture that was also a finalist for the National Book Award for Fiction. Love in Infant Monkeys is also a story collection taking a shot at our cultural fascination with famous people by telling stories about celebrities having encounters with animals. It sounds a little bizarre, but I'm sure it's good. I find it very interesting that the other two finalists were both story collections, because in recent years, story collections have had a very difficult time making headway with the Pulitzer board. The last time a true short story collection won a Pulitzer was Interpreter of Maladies in 2000, a full decade before the Pulitzer board met to discuss these finalists for 2009. Collections of linked stories did win, however, the year before Tinker's with Olive Kitteridge and the year after with a visit from the Goon Squad. It would be tempting to go down a rabbit hole speculating about whether or not Tinker's became the most likely winner out of this trio simply because it was the only novel, or if that was something deliberately done on the part of the jury. But at the end of the day, Tinker's just has a lot to recommend it. I haven't read In Other Rooms, Other Wonders, or Love and Infant Monkeys, but I have a hard time believing that they could feel more worthy than Tinker's. Outside of the finalists, there was also Colin McCann's National Book Award winning Let the Great World Spin, a novel that sort of takes the form of linked stories set on the day that Philippe Pettit walked on a high wire between the towers of the World Trade Center. The only other potential competitors I see from 2009 are Lori Moore's A Gate at the Stairs, Jane Ann Phillips's Lark and Termite, and Bonnie Jo Campbell's American Salvage. Let's get to the big question we have here. Should Tinkers have won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction? There are times when bizarre circumstances lead to the correct conclusion, even if the result felt wildly inconceivable to most people who were paying attention at the time. Tinkers winning the Pulitzer Prize for fiction was a shock, but it was, in my opinion, correct. I think about the mix-up at the Academy Awards when La La Land was accidentally named the Best Picture winner, and as the cast and crew were on stage celebrating, it was revealed that Moonlight had actually won. It was like the universe had made a correction in real time. And in this case, an events manager from an independent bookstore is standing in for the stagehand who rushed out with the correct envelope. And if you take away Paul Harding's Pulitzer for Tinkers, there's no guarantee that he would have broken through with his next book, which again was Enon, which had a very quiet release. I don't hear many people talking about Enon. It feels like a lot of people have sort of forgotten that this book exists, which makes you wonder, would he have the career that he did without the inexplicable success of Tinkers? And it also means that there's no guarantee that this other Eden would have gotten the kind of release that caught the Booker Prize's attention. The whole arc of Paul Harding's career ultimately depends on Tinker's becoming an unlikely success. In my opinion, he deserved it. I know there are a lot of people who would prefer Colin McCann's Let the Great World Spin instead of Tinker's, but I am not one of them. I was not particularly impressed by that book, if I'm being honest. And I will forever love that what seemed like a mystery is actually a story about people who are passionate about books, spreading that love, and getting the right book into the right hands. Now, all we need to do at this point is wait to see if Paul Harding becomes the first person to win a Pulitzer Prize and a Booker Prize during their career. I've really enjoyed doing this deep dive. I wanted to do it because 
of the march to potential booker success that this other Eden is having. But I had been really looking forward to reading Tinkers anyway. Basically, I was just looking for an excuse. And I'm really thrilled that there was an answer to the question of how this became the most wild Pulitzer Prize winner in my lifetime. And I just loved learning the story and I love being here to share it with you because I think it is just fantastic. And I hope you agree. Uh, again, I will have links to more Pulitzer content down below. And if you have any questions, comments, thoughts, or anything else, let me know what you think in the comment section down below. I hope you are as thrilled by this story as I was. And as always, I really appreciate your time and I will be back until next time. Happy reading.